We have uh, a great story to tell you about uh, maybe a part of Pennsylvania mining that you might not have thought of. I mean, we certainly know about anthracite mining. Uh, Mike has given us a good uh, overview of, of a lot of that. Uh, we know from, uh, from the days of Beth Steele here in Bethlehem and the early days of David Thomas, uh, all about iron. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about the, the third part of the, uh, of the mineral industry in eastern Pennsylvania, and that's the, uh, the zinc industry, which really got its start big time here in Bethlehem. Uh, wasn't the very first uh, place we mined for zinc, but it uh, really put commercial zinc uh, mining and, and processing on the map. Um, Let's see if I get the right button here. Uh, I wanted to give you just a, a quick overview of what the zinc industry in this neck of the woods looked like um, around um, 1850 or so. Uh, of course, in the northern, northwestern corner of New Jersey, you can see Franklin and Sterling Hill. Franklin was where most of the mining was taking place, both iron mining and zinc mining. Um, over in the Newark area, we had the Passaic Zinc Company, the uh, uh, Newark Zinc Works, which mainly was a New Jersey zinc type uh, operation, and the Bergen Point uh, Zinc Works. Uh, these were all pretty much located on the thing called the Morris Canal. And the Morris Canal came uh, connected on the far side of New Jersey with the Lehigh Canal that goes right down the river here for hauling anthracite coal. So, with the smelting and the mining in North Jersey, they were mainly producing zinc oxide in those days. And then they discovered the mines in Friedensville, which is just here below, uh, below Bethlehem, and uh, they led, that led to the development of the uh, Pennsylvania uh, and Lehigh zinc works right in Bethlehem. And on the tour tomorrow, we'll go by the spot where it was located, but if you crossed the New Street Bridge, or the Fahey Bridge as it's called, uh, you went right by the site of the Lehigh zinc works. Uh, so we're going to go to, to Friedensville, Pennsylvania, where the ore came from, and that's about five miles, uh, literally ten minutes probably from here. We'll go there on the tour on Monday. Uh, in, 18, in the 1840s, uh, a farmer, Jacob Uberoth, um, couldn't figure out why he couldn't grow anything on part of his farmland. And uh, in, 1940, in 1846, uh, they identified that actually they had zinc in the ground in an area of his farm field. And on this 1846 map here, um, you can see, uh, I don't know whether this is gonna, whether I can do this or not. I guess I can't do a thing. At the bottom of this map, you can see a, a little little village and above it, right where it, it uh, uh, has all those little circles, uh, that's the area in the farm field where they sunk a bunch of exploration shafts. Now these were just, just little pits that people dug from the surface down, and uh, they discovered uh, ore minerals there that were later identified as containing zinc. So um, the area was leased uh, by a, a fellow from Philadelphia. Uh, he then went to the New Jersey, what was the early New Jersey Zinc Company over in, uh, in North Jersey, offered them uh, an option on the lease, uh, they turned it down, and uh, one of their employees, Samuel Wetherill, uh, took up the option and created the uh, Wetherill and Gilbert Zinc Works here in, in Bethlehem. Um, Wetherill, of course, was known for really developing a... Uh, and patenting a, uh, a lead oxide furnace, a zinc oxide furnace rather, uh, where you roasted with anthracite coal, the zinc ore, and, uh, and then used the Jones patents for the baghouse collection of the zinc oxide. And so he really had a successful zinc oxide plant going here in Bethlehem. But the, the legal framework at that time did not permit the manufacturer to own the mines uh, or do the marketing. So a separate company was set up by a bunch of Philadelphia investors, um, and uh, that was called the uh, Philadelphia, uh, or the uh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania and Lehigh uh, Zinc Company, or something on that order. And, uh, and they 
within a year after the zinc works got started, uh, they were having big problems with uh, with Samuel Wetherill. He was quite a uh, a man about town. He had uh, he was a big horse racing guy. He uh, raised his own militia for the during the Civil War, um, and uh, so they sent Joseph Wharton to Bethlehem. And Wharton orchestrated a, basically a hostile takeover of, of uh, Samuel Wetherill's zinc company. And at the same time, some of the same players uh, in the Wharton camp got the state law changed so that, in fact, you could have complete ownership from the mine through marketing of, of zinc. And that made the, uh, that really made the, uh, the business uh, put it on a, a more formal, more managed uh, and a better financial basis. Wharton got started and he, uh, he quickly decided he was going to try to make zinc metal, or spelter as they call it. And uh, he worked, uh, ultimately brought over some of the Belgian metallurgists and, uh, and they created the first really successful high production zinc plant, zinc metal plant. Uh, again, right adjacent to Wetherill's plant down here along the uh, along the river. This is a picture of it just before, uh, kind of right after uh, uh, Wharton uh, came on board. Wharton's plant uh, would be to the left of the of the bag house, the tall building in the center, uh, and uh, and ultimately the whole uh, operation became known as the Pennsylvania and Lehigh Zinc Company. And if you drive down there today, you see a big open park. But uh, this is a Sanborn fire insurance map, uh, and it shows you that uh, on the on your left, you're looking at basically the bag houses that collected the zinc oxide, the furnaces in the middle, and the L-shaped affair over here on the right-hand side were the furnaces for uh, Wharton's uh, uh, zinc works. Wharton had an interesting agreement. He, he agreed to operate the zinc plant. He, he, he grub staked the, the plant with his own money and he agreed to operate it for five years and then he would leave the business and he did that. Fortunate, fortunately for him, I mean, they had a lot of, a lot of struggles with the technology and the, uh, and the finances, but fortunately for him, the Civil War came along and for the last three years of his management of the zinc works, uh, they made a, made a lot of money. Uh, primarily uh, for uh, uh, producing zinc metal to be used for making brass cannons and, and, the, and that type of uh, weaponry. So now let's go out to Friedensville. Uh, at the road, the road coming from the top of the, this map on this slide is the road we're going to take tomorrow. And we're going to stop at the first mine, the, the upper mine called the Uberoth mine. Uh, this was the largest of the historic five mines that operated in, uh, in Friedensville. And, uh, and the Uberoth got started uh, in the early, early 1850s. When Wharton came on board, he, uh, one of the changes he made was he hired a competent miner in his, in his as he described it in his, his uh, letters. Uh, and that competent miner was a Cornishman named Joseph, uh, Richard Pascoe. And Richard ran the mine for about a year and then while Wharton was dickering with uh, Wetherill on the hostile takeover, um, Pasco went off, worked in the, uh, in the Michigan copper country. Uh, he ultimately ended up working, uh, running a, a zinc mine in uh, North Carolina during, during the Civil War. In fact, he was listed as the Uberoth superintendent here in Pennsylvania and the Silver Hill Mine Superintendent in North Carolina. Uh, so he had a, an interest on both sides of the Civil War. Um, but he came back after the Civil War and became the superintendent uh, for another 10 years at, at the Uberoth Mine. A lot of different companies owned bits and pieces of the, uh, the area. The, the mine at sort of the center bottom, the Corel Mine, or the Saucon mine, if you see different different references to it, that was uh, was almost always owned by uh, by other companies other than the Pennsylvania and Lehigh Company, and um, and ultimately though, um, after uh, 1876, the uh, the Wetherill patents expired, 
And literally, because of uh, the cost of mining here in Friedensville, everything, everything shut down, ownership changed, and ultimately they had a company called the Friedensville Zinc Company that operated the mines into the uh, early 1890s. Now, if we're going to go see the Uberoth tomorrow, so uh, this is what uh, kind of an overview looks like. You can see kind of the vein structure. Well, these are really bedding planes of vertical dolomite beds and some cross-jointing uh, that got mineralized. It's um, uh, you see the big circle, that's the area that was the infertile part of the farmland, and they mined that on a surface mining operation. Um, it was... Uh, a mine that went down ultimately to about 225 feet, and uh, and most of the mining after say the the 45 or 50 feet below began to follow these veins uh, running all throughout the uh, the dolomite rock. Um, the biggest problem in Friedensville ever for for all time, including right up to the 1980s when they when they finished mining uh, in a modern mine there, was water. It was probably the wettest mine in the world. Um, I had a summer job there uh, when I was a Penn State student, and uh, you wore uh, New England slicker suits to work underground. It was a, you were in a continuous torrent of water. We pumped 25,000 gallons of water a minute out of the uh, out of the New Jersey zinc operation. Well, they had a similar uh, problem here. The mines weren't as deep in the in the in the uh, 1850s, 60s, and 70s, but ultimately it became a, a problem to. Uh, that taxed all combinations and permutations of pumps they put in. So they decided in uh, the late 1860s they were going to have to spring for the construction of a gigantic pumping engine. And that's going to be located, uh, if you see where it says Cornish engine pumps and, and boilers, the little square the, the large building is the boiler house, and the small square building is the uh, pump house. And we're going to visit the pump house that's still standing. In fact, it's the only pump house, Cornish pump house standing in North America. And, uh, and we'll, we'll hear more from Mark in a minute about the pump. But uh, this is what the mine looked like. This is the picture that's on the historic plaque that we dedicated uh, yesterday. And so you see kind of draped over the side of the pit here, uh, the mill on the upper portion, and then what they called the suspended shaft, which was an enclosed hoisting uh, system of, uh, of skips that uh, went kind of down on various angles to the bottom of the uh, the bottom of the working. So they hoisted ore in that, uh, in that, in that area. Uh, the big house in the background on the surface is the pump house. And if you think about it, it's probably about uh, 50 foot square on the base and maybe 70 foot tall at the, at the high point at the roof line. Uh, and then at the far right corner, your far right corner, we, you can barely see it, but there's an incline track coming down there, and that's for hoisting uh, waste rock out of the mine. So this was a, a pretty big operation. They had, at one time, 20 different steam engines that were used in various parts of these mines at Friedensville. And uh, the biggest, of course, is the one that we're going to see in just a minute here. This is the President. It was named after President Grant. Mark will tell you more on this. But this is a gigantic Cornish-style beam engine, uh, largest steam engine ever produced. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, the engine is not there. but. We have the next best thing that we're going to show you in a few minutes. Uh, when the mines all shut down, the pump was scrapped, unfortunately. But New Jersey Zinc uh, had this great consolidation in the zinc industry in 1897. And New Jersey Zinc ended up owning all this property out here south of Bethlehem. And they did some test mining just before uh, World War I. Uh, and that's what you see here. Now this looks kind of flat line. Uh, that's a little bit of a misnomer, but they were doing some bulk sampling and, uh, and they were doing it in an, in an area, uh, a different area from where the Uberoth mine was located. So they're uh, doing bulk sampling, they're doing diamond drilling, uh, they're doing churn drilling, they're doing every kind of drilling exploration technology they can do. Uh, 
through World War I into the 20s and 30s, and, uh, and finally in uh, the uh, 1940s, they decided to develop a new, the, the extension of the historic mines, and we'll see some pictures from that in a moment. So this, this is sort of the rebirth story of Friedensville. Uh, after the exploration, they, they started sinking the shaft. It took them several years because of the water, technolo uh, water uh, pumping that was required and grouting in the shaft. Um, the, the zinc price was very low in the early 50s, so they delayed operating the mine for about four years. Then they opened it up. and. Uh, New Jersey Zinc uh, operated it until Gulf and Western bought uh, New Jersey Zinc. Uh, the mine continued uh, to operate for uh, until about 1981, and uh, then the mines shut down. Uh, but um, after New Jersey Zinc finally closed the mine, then it was bought. Uh, the, the whole property in uh, Friedensville was bought by uh, a Lehigh graduate, uh, Mr. Stabler, who ran the Stabler uh, uh, Land Company, and uh, he was based in Harrisburg. And if you're, particularly for the Lehigh folks, um, you have many things here in the Lehigh campus that have the name Stabler on them now, including their their athletic uh, arena and uh, many other things. Stabler was a wonderful uh, benefactor for Lehigh, and uh, and when uh, when Stabler passed away, uh, he left the uh, the remaining. He did a lot of land development at Friedensville, and. Uh, he, and we'll see that in a moment, but, but he left the remaining land uh, to Lehigh, and so the owner of the historic mining sites out at Friedensville is Lehigh today. Now, I want to just show you a couple of pictures. Some of you, anybody ever go to the Friedensville mine? I know a couple of you have. So you experienced firsthand that it was like an, an underground rainstorm at all times. They were mining, they were mining in, uh, in another portion of the ore body, the, the, the vertical veins of ore at the Uberoth mine were one limb of an anticline, and on the, the top of the anticline was eroded off, and on the other limb of the anticline, it, it wasn't vertical, it was about 22 degrees or so. So that's the type of ore body that New Jersey Zinc uh, began to mine in the 50s. Uh, the greatest thickness was maybe 125 feet. Uh, it was a stope and pillar operation, rubber tired vehicles underground, hoops. Um, and this kind of shows how it went down as kind of a, a tubular type of ore body. Um, the upper portion on your upper left is, uh, you can see an incline ramp coming down into the mine workings. This was to bring diesel equipment in, but you can see a rather disjointed bunch of pillars over in that area. That's from historic mining that took place in the, uh, in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, then as you got down from about the middle of this picture, you can see a more organized stope and pillar kind of operation. So that's what was, uh, what was being uh, done there in, uh, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. This is a, a picture of one of the mine foremen at uh, Friedensville Mine, and it just shows you the extent of the water in some areas. Um, it really was almost like a, a karst operation with, with water just coming in by the buckets. And um, as they got down, uh, they deepened the mine uh, in the 1970s. They got down to about uh, 2,200 feet, and it, when they got there, they were pumping 35,000 gallons of water a minute. Just amazing, amazing feat. Here's a couple of pictures. We're going to go by the uh, the mine surface buildings tomorrow. Uh, the head frame is not there, but the same buildings are there. And then these are some pictures that were taken uh, underground, showing the uh, rock building on these uh, aerial platforms, uh, some of the rubber tired uh, loading and haulage equipment, and one of the several pump stations that they had underground. And I was talking at the break with John Hoyt, and John was reminding us about they had on every on every level of the mine gigantic hemispherical bulkheads that protected the shafts and the pump stations from uh, if they ever had a flood. And they occasionally had a power failure that would would fill up part of the mine with water. 
So just a quick look at what came from the mine historically. Uh, it, they produced about 800,000 tons of ore, we figure, from the, uh, the historic mines. Uh, but of course, in the early days, uh, they had ore that was running somewhere in the neighborhood of 30%, and they could hand pick ore up to 45% zinc. So this was truly uh, a zinc mine that was more like a gold mine. It was hard to lose money on this. Um, when the new mine opened in the 1950s, it was totally different. Of course, we had flotation technology and we had uh, all the LHD technology that you have in the mining systems, but of course the ore grade was much lower. And uh, so they had ranging from about five to 6% uh, zinc in the ore and uh, they produced about 14 million tons of it in, in the years that New Jersey, New Jersey zinc was operational. So with that, I uh, just want to show you one more slide, I think, and that is if you, when we go to Friedensville today, this is a Google Earth picture, but the yellow mines in the upper left-hand corner are the historic mines, five of them. The red outline is the outline of the New Jersey zinc operation, and all the green uh, areas show what has happened in the redevelopment of the area a shopping center, the Penn State Lehigh Valley campus is there, uh, a big Aldi food distribution center, and uh, a shopping center and a corporate center, all developed by Stabler when he, uh, when he bought the New Jersey zinc land. The only other thing I'll mention, historically you can see the tailings pond is still there. It's pretty much gone back to nature, uh, but that's from the New Jersey zinc era. And uh, we'll drive through the, t the town. Some interesting homes still left, the old church. Unfortunately, one of the, uh, one of the earliest uh, homes out there was, uh, was David Hartman's home, which was, uh, for which the Hartman Mine was named. Uh, that has been demolished and subsequently redeveloped. New Jersey Zinc had a little neighborhood of uh, company houses there, and that's, that's some of that stuff we'll see tomorrow. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mark Connor, who has been instrumental in uh, in work to preserve the uh, the engine house at uh, at Friedensville. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Uh, right and left, and that's cool. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Just talking to really two parts. I'm going to talk about efforts that are underway currently to preserve the engine house that Mike referenced that once held the president pump, pumping engine. And then the second part, uh, really talk about efforts to recreate the engine itself through an animated video. So um, this is a picture from uh, 18, 1874 approximately of what the engine house looked like. And this is what we see today. There's a stone ruined photograph that you see in front. So really what remains is the stone walls of the engine house. Everything else was, uh, it was gone, uh, taken away, it's salvaged that when the mine closed uh, after 1893. The engine itself was scrapped in 1900. So really nothing remains of the engine apart from one of its 22 boilers still exists in the basement of a furniture factory in Allentown. And we're hoping to get that boiler as a display item once this site is reopened as a, as a heritage area. So where are we with, uh, with preservation? We've uh, uh, had two uh, main grants from the state of Pennsylvania, Keystone Preservation Grants, which have been matched by funds from Lehigh, principally from Lehigh University. And as part of those grants, they're planning grants. So what we've done is we've studied the ruins as they currently exist, uh, made a structural assessment, made an architectural assessment. We're now in the process of do, preparing construction drawings and are about to hire uh, another consultant to help us with uh, ground preparation, uh, attractive fencing, more of the uh, soft architectural features that would, uh, we would need to, we would want to have in place if we were able to open the site uh, publicly. Uh, currently, it's not open publicly, it's restricted, it's not unimproved, but uh, Lehigh has a recreational opportunity that they're working on uh, concurrently. And assuming that all comes together, we're hopeful that we'll be able to open the park open it up for the public perhaps as early as uh, next year. So um, so now we're going to 
that's kind of what we've done on the preservation side. So now we're going to talk about what are we doing to kind of recreate the engine. So what do we have? Well, today we have, uh, we don't have original drawings of the engine. We don't even have any photographs of the engine, which is a bit of a surprise, but it, even though the engine was well known at its time, uh, no photographs were ever taken of it, that we, at least not that we're aware of. Uh, we do have a great deal of information on the engine. Um, we have sketches that were done for Scientific American and the engineer, and some descriptive, a lot of descriptive information. Uh, and perhaps the most foundational descriptive information we have on the engine is that student thesis that Henry Drinker did in 1871. And I want to bring this all back to AIM for a minute. He did his student thesis in 1871. He presented it at the Bethlehem Conference in August of 1871. And um, Henry, uh, Henry Drinker's uh, story is really kind of interesting. When he was at Lehigh, his professor, Richard Rothwell, who we heard about, uh, had a business going on in Wilkes-Barre. And he said, listen, I can't continue to come down here and teach. And I only have one student, which is you, Henry. So I'm going back to Wilkes-Barre. So uh, uh, Copley, Copley, the president of Lehigh, said, you know, uh, Henry, why don't you switch majors? Why don't you become a civil engineer? And he said, no, I don't want to be a civil engineer. I want to be a mining engineer. And so he acquired all the books that he needed. He made numerous trips up to Wilkes-Barre. And relative to, to C. Rothwell, but relative to this presentation, um, he, every Saturday he went over we call it South Mountain, but for you guys in the Rockies, we'll call it the local name, uh, Wyandotte Hill. Um, he went over Wyandotte Hill, four miles, uh, carrying a transit to uh, work at the mines. So he, every Saturday he did that. He went with a fellow by the name of Miles Rock, who was the uh, surveyor at the mines, and he was in the first graduating class of Lehigh, one of four, the only Lehigh graduate who was also a Civil War veteran. So they went over, and that's how he really learned engineering. And he said, you know, I learned engineering by working at the, at the Lehigh Zinc Works mines. So an uh, interesting story. But that, that his work is very definitive and is extremely helpful to us in doing our reconstruction. Um, for eight months, we worked with a gentleman in uh, Belgium by the name of Guy Jansen. He's a retired nuclear engineer. And uh, really worked with myself. Mike was involved. Uh, a gentleman named Damian Nance, who's an expert in Cornish engine technology. Collectively, we worked to pull together this movie. The movie is 27 minutes long. You're not going to see 27 minutes of it. We're only going to play 10. But I'll give you. Uh, 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 I'm really impressed with what uh, Guy was able to do here in terms of reconstructing this uh, this uh, significant engine. Uh, again, as Mike said, it was the largest single-cylinder stationary steam engine ever constructed. And, uh, uh, and, and in that respect, uh, truly unique. Yeah, let's hope this works. Ah. Classical music is by an American composer by the name of Heinrich. Thank you. 
rest of the movie. Um, it's another 15 minutes, but it'll go through, uh, from where we stopped, it'll actually take you through the engine itself and how it worked, kind of, di you know, section the engine and uh, the rest bounce of the equipment. Then you'll go around uh, into the pump shaft and go down and see the pumping mechanisms and how they operated. And then finally, uh, the movie takes you to, from the day that the mine closed to the present. Actually, a little bit into the future, with a view of how the engine house might look uh, once it's uh, preserved. So I'd encourage you to uh, go ahead and take a look at the bounce of the movie. It's, uh, uh, I think you'll enjoy it. So Lehigh has established a preservation fund. It's, um, uh, we have the planning done, uh, almost complete, for, uh, for the engine house. We have the construction drawings. Uh, the one thing we're going to need is money to actually do the preservation. And for you, those of you who will be there tomorrow, you'll you'll quickly see that that's, uh, that's not going to be a small undertaking. So uh, Lehigh has opened up a preservation fund, and uh, certainly uh, if anyone's interested in contributing, um, I'm sure Lehigh would uh, love to hear from you. Uh, let's see if this... Oh, okay. Thanks, Michelle. That's, that's good. And uh, just let's put back... Oh, there, yep. Uh, a lot of people involved. I just want to point out the... Uh, the number of museums and archives that uh, we accessed in order to, to make the movie. Uh, we also made this, uh, I didn't make it, we had an artist make this uh, pencil sketch, a gentleman by the name of Alex Carnes, a very capable technical artist with a, a great love also for steam engine technology, and made this uh, very nice pencil sketch. This is a copy of it, uh, but uh, it might take a moment after, uh, after the presentation to take a look at it. Uh, and also our contact information, if you'd like to uh, talk to, uh, to Mike or myself, or actually see the balance of the movie, we have a website. The movie is on that, and I believe, Michelle, you'll also be sharing the slides. So uh, uh, that's, that's the story of uh, the Friedensville Mine, the President Engine, and where we are. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark.